Well, I'm thrilled to be here this afternoon um, with all of you. Just a little bit of a background in terms of who I am and where I came from. <laughs> um, my name is Dr. Caitlin Coyle. I'm a research professor at UMass Boston in the Gerontology Institute. And in, over the course of about the last year, we've been working with um, the South County Senior Center and the towns of Sunderland, Deerfield, and Waitley on a community needs assessment specifically on the population of residents age 50 and older. And we have completed that work, and I'm here this evening to share sort of some of the highlights that we found. So not everything you, so there's a lot of information in the, in the, in the report, which will be coming shortly. Um, what I've done is sort of pulled out the highlights uh, for you here. I imagine that many of you completed a survey. It was probably now been back um, in early in the, in the winter time um, that you completed that, that paper survey for us. So I wanna thank you all for your time and energy and putting that, putting that in. Um, and I'm gonna just sort of walk us through, oops, my clicker here. Um, so as I mentioned, this was a project that was supported by the three communities of Deerfield, um, Waitley, and Sunderland to investigate uh, sort of the needs and the preferences of the, the population age 15 older as it relates to their um, need for services as they age in, in the communities, but also their preferences for programming. Um, the final report and the presentation that I'm making this evening really has um, a couple of purposes. One, to um, generally increase the awareness about this uh, particular segment of the population with respect to its growth and the size of the population here in the region, but also um, to inform the towns, not just about the needs and the preferences as they relate to the South County Senior Center, but as we all know, aging happens outside of the senior center. It happens all over the community. And so we did touch on things like housing and transportation and economic security, which we'll be um, talking a little bit about this afternoon as well. So I'm gonna start with just some very basic demographic information. And these data come from the American Community Survey, which is a product of the US Census Bureau. It's a survey that's done in between the decennial census. Um, so we have, the, the data that I'm using are the 2016 to 2020 estimates. So they take data from across those five, that five year period and produce um, estimates in, in, in a very variety of different domains. Uh, what, I, what you see here is the region of South County. So we combined the, the populations of Waitley, Sunderland, and Deerfield compared to the state of Massachusetts when it comes to age distribution. Um, and what you can see is that South County is uh, older than the, the state of Massachusetts as a whole. So when we think about um, the, the red bars there are the age 60 to 79, and you've got, um, that's where you see a lot of the difference. Um, and then in the, the folks 50 to 59, you see about a 2% difference between what's happening here in the region and the state as a whole. So again, we're thinking about those younger seniors, so people in their 50s and their 60s who are actually driving a lot of the growth um, in the older adult population here in the region. Um, and this is another um, sort of general uh, slide using those same data, looking at the age distribution of the region. Um, what you can see is that about 29%, 29% of the region is age 60 and older um, at, at using the 2020 estimates that I mentioned before. We use this, the 60 plus cutoff, that's sort of what our, um, here in the US, sort of what our government policies dictate is being an older adult. Um, so 29% of your population currently is about 60 plus. Um, we do have estimates putting us out to 2035 that suggest that by 2035, more like 37% of the region will be older adults in the community. And that's fairly significant as we think about planning for the, the, the changes in the demographics. There's a couple of things that are driving this. Um, I already mentioned sort of that younger um, age group, people in their 50s and 60s some of which are the baby boomers. So we've got sort of just a, a large group of people. We know that people are living longer, so they're um, aging in, in community longer, um, as well as there's um, a trend, I think, for people to retire in the region. Um, so you've got people who are coming um, to the area to, to, to retire. So all of those things together um, create sort of this growth in the older adult population. And of course, um, the ability for young folks to stay in the area is another dynamic that also contributes to sort of the increase in proportion seniors. Um, wanted to just sort of touch on a little, a few other demographic pieces related to the older adult population here in, in the South County region. Um, 
A couple of things, uh, two things here on the slide. One is the rate of disability. Um, and so what we see in the pie chart here is that about 24% of your uh, residents age 65 and older report at least one disability. And when I say disability, I mean really sort of functional disability or physical disability. So the ability to walk upstairs, um, walk long distances, that kind of thing. So again, about a quarter of the older adult population has a level of disability. And as we think about community planning, um, and, the, and what kinds of things people are not, not only do they want to do, but that they're able to do, I think it's important to recognize that not everyone is able-bodied. The other thing I wanted to mention is that 23% of residents in this region live alone. So that's close to a quarter of our older adult population living alone. That by, <clears throat> by no means means that that many people are socially isolated, but it certainly is an indicator for what kinds of supports, um, both community and social supports, those folks are going to need as they age in place. Um, more specifically, 37% of people who live alone also own their home. So why is that important? One, um, because it speaks a little bit to, um, again, the kinds of services and supports that people are going to need as they age in place. Maintaining a home takes a lot of work and resources. Um, and so thinking about that population um, having, um, also, it also drives quite a bit of wealth when we think about socioeconomic status. So again, thinking about um, a lot of folks um, in the region own their homes, specifically people who live alone. Um, this is looking at household income, again, um, in using the 2020, it's, it's in 2020 inflated dollars. And I think the two sort of takeaways that I would um, sh in, you know, sort of show here is that in the 65 plus, so the bottom bar is people 65 plus, that's our older adult population, and the bar at the top is age 45 to 64. So those are sort of those probably still working but moving into the older adult um, category. And what we see is that um, you've got quite a few more people who are living under the $50,000 a year mark in the older adult category. Um, so you, so the, the yellow and red bars combined uh, com make up the, the number of people who are living on less than $50,000 a year, and that that's uh, significantly higher in the older adult population. It makes sense. Um, folks in that age bracket are typically living on fixed incomes, um, and so that drives quite a bit of it. But I think it's important as we think about our community recognizing that one of the, the big factors that influences aging in place is, is that fixed income. It is that le le having fewer resources coming in to a household, um, which dictates how people are able to live in later life. So those are sort of some background. So really wanting to just sort of illustrate who are the older adult population in, in the region. And now I'm going to move to talking a little bit more about what me and my team did here in the region over the last sort of nine months or so. So the demographic profile, which I just gave you a smattering of uh, pieces of information, that was done. Um, we also did um, some interviews with peer communities, so communities that are surrounding uh, d uh, the, the communities of South County. And we also did a resident survey of residents of all three communities age 50 plus. We received 1,393 surveys um, for a response rate of 36%, which is very incredible. Um, I will say it's um, in my time doing this work, it's one of the highest response rates that we've ever um, had. And I think that in and of itself speaks to the importance of this issue, both to the three communities, but also to the folks who live here. When they had the opportunity to make their voices heard about this, these issues, they took advantage of that. Um, so again, very Im impressive uh, response rate. Um, so the first, first set of slides is really um, talking about people's attachment to the region and the community. So we asked people how important it is for them to stay in the South County area. And um, by and large, most people find it very important for them to stay here. That does decrease. So you've got um, people in the younger age groups um, find it less important to stay. So in the, this gray bar is, what we, is where we see people who say it's not really important for them to stay. So 16% of people in their 50s, 9% of people in their 60s, 7% of people in their 70s, and 6% of people in their 80s say it's not very important for them to stay here. But a large majority of people say, yes, it is important for them to stay here. Um, we asked them, we asked survey, res <laughs> survey respondents, what are the things that concern them the most about being able to stay in the region as they get older? 
we reviewed, um, there were hundreds of write-in responses that we reviewed each of them and put them into themes and categories. And what I show here is just a few examples of what people wrote in. So the number one reason, number one concern for people um, as they think about aging in, these, in this region is uh, the cost of taxes and the cost of living. This is not uncommon um, for us to see, but um, some, some examples are people be talking about being able to afford taxes and the upkeep of property, um, being able to afford the taxes, which may be the reason that I have to leave my home, that kind of thing. The second most commonly reported concern about being able to live in the area is transportation. People are uh, very worried about when I can no longer drive that there isn't enough um, transportation resources for people to feel like they can stay. Um, so an example is I'm a widow without children. I live alone. At the moment, I can still drive. When I won't be able to drive, I will be stranded. So that general sort of sentiment of maybe it's not affecting me right now, but as I think about my ability to stay in the region, that that's a major uh, a concern. The third most commonly reported concern was related to individuals' sort of health and mobility and how that affects their ability to, to live independently. So for example, um, diminished mobility and the ability to maintain my own home, to live safely in my house, I'm thinking about falls, keeping up with routine household tasks, maintenance on the house, health issues, et cetera. So this linkage between, it's not just that I'm worried about my health, I'm worried about how my health will impact my ability to live independently, was the third most commonly uh, reported concern. Um, we then asked uh, respondents about their uh, participation at the South County Senior Center. And uh, what we see in this uh, line graph is very uh, typical for what we normally see. So folks who are in their 50s, about 6% of them said that they'd ever participated in a senior center program or service. And that, gen that uh, trend goes upward with age. So in your 80 plus group, 38%, of people in their 80s said that they have ever participated in a program or um, received services from the South County Senior Center. So the trend is pretty typical, but overall I would say that that's low um, in terms of um, even within the 80s, we usually um, see a higher percentage of people who said that they've um, been to the Senior Center. Uh, among those who said that they had ever used the center, Senior Center, uh, more than half of them have only come come about once a year for events. So they're not regular participants. Um, over half of the people, so we've already got a small number of people who say that they've ever been. Um, and then among those who said they've ever been, uh, quite a few of them only come about once a year. We then asked them why they don't come. <laughs> um, so anybody who said, I, I've never been to the South County Senior Center, we asked them why. And these are the top, uh, top reasons. So the number one reason why is that they are unaware of programs and services that are offered. The second most common uh, response was actually uh, people writing in other. Um, and it, uh, when we looked at what they said, it was predominantly that they are still working. And there was this sentiment of not, not needing the senior center. And I think that's interesting to note because uh, those of us like myself and probably Jen, when we think about senior centers, we don't necessarily think about, um, you, you don't have to have a need <laughs> to participate, right? But that seems to be the perception in the community that I don't need help yet, so it's not, not relevant to me. Um, and then the last two most commonly reported reasons why they don't come is that they're not interested and I'm not old enough. Uh, which I think also speaks to, certainly there, we, you know, we survey people 50 plus, and so there's quite a few people who probably don't identify with um, being an older adult, but I think in general, nobody likes to identify as, as getting old. Um, and so that's just another reason. So I think just really thinking about what that means as far as the perception of the senior center in the community is, is interesting. We did ask a more broad question about um, whether or not respondents felt like the South County Senior Center played a role in their life or in the life of someone they know? And 62% said yes to that question. So despite the fact that we've got low rates of participation and a lot of folks who only come like once a year for an event here or there, um, still you know, quite a few people, a major more than a majority of people um, do find it to be sort of a valuable asset in the community as a whole, which I think is um, important to recognize. Um, we then asked, what would increase your the likelihood of you participating? And in this, this figure, um, the orange bars are for people who said they've never been to the senior center, and the blue bars are for people who have gone to the senior center. So we wanted to compare what would get people who've never been to a senior center program in the door, 
and what are the things that would in increase the likelihood of people who do participate to, to come more often. Um, what you can see is that this sort of the, 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 the most commonly reported reason that it sort of would increase the likelihood of participation is if I had more knowledge about the programs and services that are available. So really a communications issue about what, what, what is available to me. If I knew more about it, I would be per perhaps more likely to attend. Um, interestingly, so that was the number one reason for both non-users and users. Um, for non-users, the second highest reason reported was if programs and services were better suited to my interests. So again, trying to th you know, think about the variety of things that are available to folks. Um, among users, the second most commonly, um, was also the, that was also the second, second most commonly reported um, reason. Um, but then in third place was if it was easier to access the senior center building, um, updated building, that kind of thing. So that was among users. And we all know that there's um, challenges where the space is at this current moment. And so thinking about the fact that space does actually uh, matter when it comes to increasing the likelihood of participation. Uh, so this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out for you, the imp important pieces. Um, we asked people, um, besides what's already happening at the Senior Center, what are the things that you would like to participate in? So what kinds of programs and activities are, are uh, preferable to you? And this is actually broken down by age group. So I'm going to start with the people in their 50s, which is the, the blue bar. And the sort of top three reason, things that the people in their 50s would like to participate in are outdoor exercise, uh, physical health and well-being, including exercise classes, um, and fitness space, including gym or pool. So it was pretty clear that people in their 50s are looking for physical activity of a variety of, of modalities, but that's what they're interested in. Um, people in their 60s, it was generally a, a very, pretty similar trend in terms of um, the outdoor exercise, physical health, and fitness. But um, what we noticed about people in their really 60s and 70s uh, and 80s is an interest in lifelong learning. That emerged as sort of the third. So, so for the people in their 50s, across the board, it was physical health. For people in their 60s and up, it started to be sort of physical health, but also lifelong learning kind of came up into the top three. So really, people are looking for um, physical development as well as intellectual development uh, when it comes to what would interest them. Um, we had a lot of people who wrote in other things that they would like to see at the Senior Center, and so I included um, a few of those examples in this slide. Um, there was talk of clubs, so whether that's a book club, a memoir writing club, a documentary club, discussion groups, that kind of thing. There was a sense of wanting to sort of stay connected to a group of people, not just a one-time event, but something that meets more regularly. Um, there was an interest in sort of community service, um, and sort of whether it's volunteering themselves or um, having volunteers to help do things like, you know, uh, maybe a training for local handymen, that kind of thing. So sort of this service um, aspect that people wrote in about. Um, we heard a lot of sort of more specific uh, fitness and exercise things. So indoor walking during the winter time um, and, and, and pickleball courts uh, was something else that people wrote in. And then there was a number of arts programs that were written in in terms of people wanting um, you know, photography classes, musical performances, m music lessons. So again, I think it's interesting to think about, it's not just they want access to consume art, but they want to also have the ability to learn about different art mediums and, and performances. Okay, so that's sort of the senior center uh, pieces. Um, moving on to some of the housing information, um, we did ask a question, does your current residence have a bedroom and bathroom on the entry level? And this is an indicator of sort of the ability for someone to live in their home uh, safely over time. And it was about 31% uh, of people said no. They do not have that scenario. Um, and so that's just, I think, important as we think about needs of the community that the housing stock is not necessarily going to work for everyone as they age and their, their physical health changes. Uh, we also asked about whether or not people need um, home modifications, so things like railings on stairs or ramps or grab bars and showers um, in order to be able to stay in their home safely. 46% uh, of people said, yes, I do need that. And among them, 9% said they could not afford 
to make those modifications. So a vast majority of people who said, yes, I need to do that, um, could afford to do it. <laughs> so that's a place where we can think about, you know, sort of programming or planning for helping people to sort of think ahead a little bit, but also to recognize that for some people that's not an option. Um, economically. We asked a very similar question about home repairs. This is different. This is more like I need, a, I need new windows or I need um, a roof or I need a stairwell fixed or something, sort of more home repair. 41% um, said yes, I need those kinds of things and a slightly higher portion said they could not afford to do that. Um, so again, I think all taken together, these three sort of point to um, people's uh, sort of the housing stock and the way that it, it could uh, or could not support people as they age and what programs and services might be available to help them uh, live safely. We asked, we know um, that a lot of people don't want to move. <laughs> they like, they want to stay where they are. So we had to sort of prompt them a little bit and we asked if you had to move um, because of a change in your health, what kind of housing would you prefer? And again, um, we're starting with the people under age 60, so people in their 50s um, who, who would prefer to live in a single family home. So uh, that's, that's their preference. Um, people in their 60s, um, that's when we start to see a 55 plus community. So people are interested in living with uh, peers. Uh, that's still independent living, but it's generally less maintenance and less, um, less work. And then as we think, and that's similarly true for people in their 70s, that was their most preferred type of housing. And then people in their 80s, their most preferred type of housing was assisted living community. And that's where you get into a little bit more of the support of housing. Um, so as we think about where people might go if they can no longer stay in their single family home, these are some of the places they talked about wanting to go. Okay, <clears throat> so we asked people about their driving status. 4% of the about 1,400 people who we surveyed said they do not drive at all. Um, that jumps to 15% of people in their 80s um, who say they don't drive at all. Uh, we also asked if people modify their driving in some way, so they still drive, but maybe they don't drive at night, or they avoid driving when it's raining, or they don't really go out of town because you know, in unfamiliar places. And 42% of respondents said yes, they do limit their driving in some way. So when we think about um, you know, people's ability to be participate in the community, it may not be, you know, yes, it's important for people who don't drive at all, but it also potentially could support people who would prefer not to drive themselves and would rather um, take a, a transportation of some kind. So um, among those who say they don't drive, 25% um, have missed a medical appointment in the past year. Um, due to a lack of transportation. So again, thinking about among people who don't drive, which yes, that's a small portion, um, but that is a, a significant barrier to them in terms of being able to access necessary uh, services. And then 6% of people who say that they drive with uh, modifications also say that they have missed a medical appointment in the last year because of transportation. Um, interestingly, um, we did ask people generally about their satisfaction with transportation options. Um, and 25% of those who do not drive or drive with limitations are dissatisfied. So what's interesting about this is when I look at just the whole sample on that question, it looks like everybody's pretty satisfied. It's, you know, it's looking pretty good. But then when I actually look at just people who say they don't drive or drive with limitations, it goes way up. So that's a place where it may not be a need for everybody, but it's an important need for those who have the, the need. Um, caregiving. Uh, we asked... In the last um, five years, have you provided care to someone who is frail or disabled? And it was a 50-50 split. So 50% of survey respondents said, yes, I have been a caregiver in the last five years. Among them, we asked how difficult it was for them to do that and meet the sort of responsibilities of their daily life. And 58% of people who provided care said it was very challenging for them to both provide the care and meet their daily responsibilities. So caregiving is definitely something that's happening in the region, um, which you all probably know, um, but I think it's important to think about, they may not have the time or energy to come to programs or services at the senior center, but they could certainly use some recognition or support. Uh, we also asked if because of a health issue, you require help around the house. And what you see here is a pretty steady uh, increase over, over the age groups, um, where 4% of people in their 50s say, yes, I need help with activities around the house. 
compared to 44% of people in their 80s who need help around the house. Again, thinking about supporting um, people living independently in the community. Um, the other sort of health-related question is about, uh, we asked us some questions about food access. So this pie chart here, um, in my neighborhood, it is easy to buy healthy food. And we asked people to rate their level of agreement with that. And the gray pieces and the yellow pieces are both um, disagree or strongly disagree. And what you see is about 25% of people say they disagree that they cannot easily buy healthy food in their neighborhood, um, in, their, in their area. So that's, I think, important to think about. Again, as people are um, trying to remain living independently, we add the transportation to that. It's just something else that I think that is, is important to recognize as we think about what kinds of needs people are gonna have as they age. Um, we asked people, do you know someone living nearby on whom you can rely for help? And 12% of people said no. What's interesting about that is it actually is higher among the younger age groups. So it's 12% for the population as a whole, and I think it was more like 16% for, the, for folks in their 50s. So it's not drastically higher, but it is sort of um, an interesting trend. Um, we asked people if you, would, if you would ask a neighbor for help, and 33% said no, <laughs> they would not ask a neighbor for help. Um, for a minor task or errand. So again, trying to understand sort of um, how people are being supported in the community and one way we think about as neighbors. Um, so that being said, 47% uh, do not provide the help, but they would if they were asked. So it goes to that whole idea of like, a lot of people say, no, I don't do that now, but a lot of people said, if, you, if someone asked me, I would. Um, and so thinking about how we might be able to mobilize people to support one another in the community, I think is an interesting opportunity to think about. Um, I think this is close to our last, last slide, but we asked people about how they like to get information about what's going on in the community. Um, we also asked about internet access. So 65% uh, of respondents report having access to the internet at home via a smartphone, and 85% uh, have access using a computer or tablet. So by and large, um, a majority of people do have access to the internet um, using one, or one of these two devices. Um, we also asked about a source of information, um, specifically about the South County Senior Center, and the top two um, preferred sources, one was the Senior Center newsletter, so really thinking about how we can make sure that that's being maximized as far as its distribution across the three communities. Um, and then town website was actually the second highest, so again, thinking about, especially across the three communities, thinking about how that website um, looks um, on the different town websites and how information is shared consistently across the three, I think is important um, to think about. Oh, not the last one. Last, this is the last one. Um, we did ask people about their, their working status. So 38% of respondents are still working full or part-time. Um, and so that's obviously an indicator in terms of their ability to participate in programs or services at the South County Senior Center in terms of their working hours. Um, and we also asked, uh, how much do you agree with the following statement? I have adequate resources to meet my financial needs. Uh, the gray parts of these bars are the number of people who said uh, they disagree with that statement, meaning they do not feel like they have enough resources to, to meet their needs. So it's fairly uh, consistent across age groups, which is interesting, about 15% um, of each age group saying that they do not have adequate resources to meet the need. Um, so this is just sort of some summary uh, findings uh, for, for me. Uh, one is that we can think about um, the demand for senior center programs and services is expected to escalate in coming years, and specifically information about what is available is not widely known. Um, the physical space and programming of the South County Senior Center does not currently meet the needs um, or the range of ages, uh, uh, sorry, needs of the range of ages or the interests. Um, and there's a lot of interest. So there's a lot of interest in people. There's not a lot of people using it, but what we heard is there's a lot of interest in people wanting to actively age in this region. Um, and they told us about their interest in being physically active and intellectually active. So there's a need out there. Um, it's just not quite making, there's just not quite a good fit um, and so thinking about how we can adapt the current senior center services and space to sort of um, uh, re respond to that need, I think, is, is needed. Um, supplementary, supplementary and accessible transportation is a concern for people as they age. Um, a lot of people 
need support, either because they, they themselves have a physical uh, condition um, or they are caregivers. Um, and so that's, you know, half of the survey respondents said that they provide care and more than half of them said it was very difficult for them to do so and maintain their other responsibilities. So that is another sort of um, high level finding. And then lastly, that economic insecurity is a concern for older adults in the area, um, more specifically including access to food um, and affording things like internet and cable. So I have a few sort of recommendations that I can walk through, but I can also pause um, at this moment and, and ask um, if anyone has any questions about sort of the data pieces uh, of the presentation. Oh, and I think, yep, Jen's going to come by with the microphone. Hi there, a very good presentation, thank you. Yeah. Um, I was just, I know you look at economic insecurity, but what about food insecurity? Did you look at that in terms of, I know you talked about healthy food, but just, um, are they giving up food because they have to buy medication right. or they're trying to pay their taxes or yep. whatever? Yes, so we did, we asked two questions about food. One was the one that I showed here about do you have access to healthy food easily in your area, which is about 25% of people said no to that question. The other question was, um, do you, how many times in the last year have you worried about your food running out before you had money to get more? Um, and the rate of response on that was more like 7% of people said yes, that happens to me. Um, so it was definitely, it's there. Um, it wasn't quite as, as prevalent as sort of the local easy access to healthy food. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi, on the slide that had the um, percentage of people in town who participate in the senior center, yeah. you commented that that's low compared to other towns. Can you talk about the rate of participation in a place that has a fairly robust senior center? Yeah, well, I can, um, I can tell you what it usually looks like, that slide. Um, I don't want to make too many inferences about the robustness of the, the services, but typically, um, especially in the, um, so this is normal. You know, uh, it's usually about under 10% of, of sort of people, even in their 60s, it's usually under 10%. Um, that's normal. What, what we usually see is a much steeper incline um, over the age groups. So this is usually more like 30%, and this is closer to 50%. Um, uh, again, I think it also, it's always a little bit of a game because the survey sample, um, a lot of people ha had never been to the senior center, so it's in other places. Anyway, so there's some noise happening, but I think um, in general. And then the other thing that's, that's a little bit unique is this 56% um, of people who said, yes, I've ever been to or ever participated, but I've only, I only do that about once a year. That's, that's actually more significantly high than what we normally see in communities. It's usually more like 30%, 35% of people. So there's um, not a very high sort of regular attendance, which isn't a bad thing. Um, it's just sort of interesting to note sort of um, the rates of participation. Does anyone else have a question? Is this uh, data something that the town sort of access to, to delve deeper, because I would say on every one of these slides, I've got five questions. <laughs> so I think sure. I said, you know, just like, well, what does that data really mean? Mm -hmm. And I work with data a lot. So. Yeah, yeah, yes. So um, so the answer, the, the short answer is yes. So at, at the report, I actually have it here in front of me. It's about 85 pages. But the, there's an appendix um, in the report which has every single survey question cross-tabbed by age um, so that you can look sort of at each of the, the um, questions itself. If you had uh, questions like, I'd like to see this question uh, across, you know, by people who have a disability or something like that, that's something you could certainly ask me about. So we don't turn over the data file um, just because of our like, reasons we can't just share it widely. Um, but we certainly, those kinds of questions can be inquiries to us and we're happy to produce those figures. So anything that's across, like we can answer this question this way, I want to know what they did on this question. I can't have that data, right. but I can ask you, yep. and you'll like do that for me like a thousand times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can tell you just from my own um, the back. What I do is I cross tab every question by age, gender, disability status, and driving status, um, and I kind of pull out what stands out. So I can I can say with some certainty that if it didn't stand out to me, 
it didn't make it in the report, and if it did stand out to me, it did. Um, that doesn't mean it's not interesting to you, <laughs> um, but just so you know, those things were looked at, um, at least to some extent, as well as the usership. So we looked at a lot of things by users, non-users. Gentleman in the back. How, how important is it to have senior specific programs versus programs that, or the senior center getting information to the seniors that programs are available? Such as, I noticed on your intellectual part, well, maybe the local libraries are offering programs. How, how important, and the seniors really desire that separation from the rest of the people in town? Yeah, <clears throat> it's a good question. <clears throat> um, the short answer is it depends, which is always true, but I think what we know is that it is not necessarily important for people to be complete, for older, for seniors to be isolated from the rest of um, age groups. I think the, the tricky part becomes when you start to throw around words like multi-generational or even intergenerational, the thing that we do find is that there's a little bit of pushback when it comes to, I don't wanna take classes with 10 year olds, um, or I don't wanna be doing exercise with people who are 40 years younger than me. Um, so I think, so that would be my, it, it, what's, what, we he, what I heard from the respondents was that they want lifelong learning and they want physical activity. I did not necessarily hear that that needs to come from the South County Senior Center. But those are the kinds of things that they said would increase the likelihood of them coming. So um, that's the question of whether or not it matters to the communities to drive people to the Senior Center or whether um, those things can be made available through other outlets. So I, I had a follow-up question to that, just on the topic of housing. Mm -hmm. um, was there a reason why the question of intergenerational housing was not specifically asked, and is that is there a reason why? Um, yes, that the the reason why is that it's not um, something that's very common um, in terms of. We ask questions about sort of thinking about planners and people who are thinking about what kind of housing is going to be developed um, in the area. And so we tend to stick to those kinds of categories. Um, so it was more about like the, the type of housing, like a, a assisted living or a 55 plus community. I think intergenerational housing can happen a lot more organically than that. Um, and so we did not ask, but we did ask, the thing that I didn't include in here um, that we did ask was we asked about um, sort of the number of people who live in your current household and how many of them were children. So we're ha we do have the ability to sort of look at how many sort of multi-generational households already exist um, in, the, in the area. So I didn't include that in the slide, but that is something that we asked in the survey. I was wondering with these statistics, um, responding, was there a percentage from each town that you could give us, like how many responded from the Sunderland Yes, um, so of the about 1,400 survey respondents, 56 of them came from Deerfield, 26% uh, came from Sunderland, and 18% came from Wheely. So pretty, you know, pretty on par, I think, with the size of those communities in terms of just the sheer number, but yes. <laughs> What you don't realize is the mail, Wakeley's mail, goes to South Deerfield. So some people throw the thing away if it says South Deerfield. We live in Wakeley. We're in Wakeley now. So we don't, so some of the surveys were not done for that reason. Uh, yes, but it got mailed to you in your scoop, so. Oh, and, and if, if the scoop would put in more articles about the senior center, some of the things were not put in there, and it's after the fact. Mm -hmm. Some people in town had asked, where is the senior center? Mm -hmm. They have no clue. Oh, they're not there yet. And they haven't experienced what the other senior centers are like also. Right. And I, I'm gonna say, I, I go to the South County Senior Center, and they're very accommodating. They've always made me feel welcome. I've gone to other senior centers, and they made me feel like a jerk. Mm -hmm. 
to ask for a doctor's note or to use their exercise equipment and it just it's not friendly so when you sit ask why the senior doesn't go yeah now most of the people that live here in the valley they work yes the seniors they don't have a lot of time to hang around right. they're, they're doing something so it's it's entirely different well, I think that's really true, both the, the number of people that are still working and also if we added onto that the number of people who are providing care to someone, um, and that's a very time-consuming and energy-consuming uh, set of tasks as well, that there's a good reason why people aren't coming, right? So it's, you know, they're working or they're providing care. They don't have, as you say, the time um, to, be, to be participating. So that doesn't mean that they don't also need the sort of support and recognition and um, acknowledgement that they exist <laughs> um, in the community. And most seniors, uh, they're usually in the daytime, they've got chores or things to do. So if there was an evening program or a different other time, you could probably get more seniors that would participate. Mm -hmm. I think, and if we had a space, that you all, <laughs> and if you had a space, right? Yes. That's the big elephant in the room. That is the big elephant in the room. Um, thank you for. It, 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 is, it yes. is the issue that, you know, that we're all here looking at and trying to figure out how do we deal with it and how do we support it from each community. And, and it's interesting the breakdown. It's very similar to our schools, kind of all the same kind hmm. of, you know, breakdown of how things work or yeah. EMS shared EMS and I did actually also, um, just before poll, so, so I gave you the survey respondents by town, but in terms of the proportion seniors per town, also I was... Um, curious if there was a big difference there in terms of like one community has a lot more higher proportion seniors and it's actually um, in Deerfield it's 31% of the community is age 60 or older um, in Waitley 32% um, is 60 or older and in Sunderland it's 21% um, so that's sort of interesting too when we think about sort of the usership so to speak um, in each of the three communities um, but no, I agree, the, and we, um, th I shared this with Jen, but there were a number of places for people to write in um, thing, various things, and we heard a whole lot about the lack of space um, and the lack of, um, yeah, space to gather for any of this. Um, so, yeah. I'm just wondering about uh, the services that may or may not be provided to help us stay in our homes as long as we can, as opposed to activities that draw you to the senior center. It's a great question. I mean, I think that's, um, so you're thinking about things that help you stay in the home, so, you know, help with maintenance and cleaning and cooking and things like that. There is, um, we certainly heard about that as a need here in the survey. I can tell you just from my travels um, that it's a huge need across the state and the, and the issue is there's no one to do those to do that work um, as far as providing those kinds of services um, the state has a home care program but there's eligibility requirements to that and then there's a sort of a shortage in the workforce but i do think um, we heard a lot about we really heard quite a bit about home maintenance in in a lot of, not just in the questions that we asked about that but also in terms of other things like the, the question about concerns um, about staying in the area as you age. It wasn't just about um, even a home maintenance, but sort of more like property maintenance and just sort of the ability to remain independent um, as being a real issue. And I think part of that speaks to sort of the, the space um, that people, you know, a lot of people have some property or they, there's space in between houses. Um, and so that's something that people are concerned about. So we heard about it, I think uh, what we do about it there are some models. Um, I think that maybe even you guys have some of them in the, in the area as far as um, groups of, of seniors uh, working together to sort of exchange. Um, so they call them like villages, essentially, but um, yes. I was gonna say, I, I thought I saw that you guys have something similar to that, but you don't necessarily have to even formalize it as much as that, but you know, to just sort of think about how uh, people can sort of uh, support each other neighbor to neighbor um, is a way I think that some communities are figuring out how to deal with that. I've got a couple hands in the back. One of the, for me, one of the interesting slides that you put up was about the ability or not, the, the not having the ability to repair homes. Yes. 
in the, the slide, that slide with the fact of where people get their information, some of them has partnered with other communities to get these community block records, CDBGs. We, we always use acronyms for everything. Yes, you must and, be a town government. <laughs> yes, and, and, but we, we use these community block grants for, for this program specifically so that many times you can get your home upgraded at no cost. And, and or they look at you paying the cost back, but they really don't, you don't have to. But I saw where people get their information. Yes. And the Senior Center newsletter, that, and, and you had a wide yes. response. Got, and we go begging many times. We do not have enough people that apply for this, the CDBG grants. So and I, I think that's important because we never advertise or quote, advertise in the senior newsletter. So that really, that's really critical information. I think you're right. Thank you for raising that. My clicker isn't working anymore, so yeah. One thing I do want to say before we move forward with additional questions is that um, one plan that we're working on at the Senior Center is to host an information fair so that we, different um, community partners, whether they're nonprofits or government agencies, can come in and share that information and do like a, you know, like a, almost like when you go to a job fair, you just have every vendor set up, share that information so that more people, you know, are aware of the services. And um, this gives us at the center a big starting point as to how to share the information, what approaches to take and to move forward. Um, so thank you for all of the informative questions and also sharing what services are out there because there's a lot of services that many people don't under, don't realize are available to them. Yeah, that's a great point, Jen. And just one of the recommendations that's in the report is also related to specifically for caregivers because we hear a lot of, of folk, you know, they just don't know where to start to try to find resources or support. And so some communities have done either like a boot camp, like a caregiver boot camp, or it's like a half day workshop where they just sort of figure out, okay, this is what's available to me and this is how I access those things. But I think any kind of that sort of serving the information on a, on a platter so that people don't have to go looking for it themselves is really helpful. Other question? Hi, my thoughts around this start with the framing of the survey. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding from the framing of the survey and this conversation is that the framing of the survey and this conversation are based around the word need much more than want. And having done a lot of market research in my time, mm -hmm. um, I wonder, and you may have some insights into this. I wonder whether this survey is somewhat different if the survey had been, or the discussion, if the survey had been framed around want. Um, you know, we historically have looked at the senior center as a place for seniors to get services, mm -hmm. assistance. But I think the data that you've shown also shows that that there's a there's a, a, a market opening. Mm -hmm. For people who don't need and don't want, Absolutely. but they but they but or don't need or don't don't desire assistance, but they yeah. want to participate. Um, and, and I and I just wonder whether that framing and now the lessons learned from that would help us better understand how to provide want as opposed to need, um, and also to assimilate into becoming a senior because none of us want to think about being a senior, and I'm I'm pretty darn close to that now. Yes, um, but. You know, for example, offering financial um, financial planning assistance to people who are in their 30s at the senior center, it, it may be a glide path to saying, oh, the senior center is a place that I actually want to attend because I, I can do things as opposed to I want to attend because, or I need to attend because I, I'm frail or I need assistance or I, I, I don't have the income to. It just, it just an interesting, I, I no, love I your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I think it's a really important point. Um, and, and it combined with what we heard about people, what people are looking for, what they do want to, how they do want to spend their time, we heard about that. But we also heard about a, a pretty big lack of communication about what, like al almost always when we asked why don't you use it or what would help you use it more, it was about I don't know what happened. I don't, I don't have enough information. So I think combining that with some sort of marketing strategy about um, information about, uh, you know, here's, all these great things that you want to do, and then being able to sort of also have that information about what the services are, the need, needs-based things, um, is really, I think that's, I agree with you that there's a huge opportunity 
Um, and I think the other thing that was interesting in a lot of the write-ins, um, there was a lot of people who either had never been there, and there were some people that even talked about like feeling like shy <laughs> about going there. Um, but there was also quite a few people who said they're new to the area or new to the town. Um, so I don't know if there's been new housing um, developed recently. I'm here seeing some nods. But that was interesting to me too. And so one of my thoughts and recommendations was also sort of how do we tap into the newcomer market or the, the people who are um, even retiring, like early retirees, that kind of thing. As, again, to sort of be framing it as far as the senior center is a place you want to go, uh, not a place that you have to have a need to go. Um, and I think that goes in, there's a lot of things related to that in terms of marketing, you know, what are, we, what are we calling it? Nobody wants to call it, you know, nobody wants to be a senior, so maybe it shouldn't be the senior center. You know, that kind of, all that sort of marketing level stuff, I think, is important. I just want to say that you're hitting on all the uh, ideas and <laughs> concepts that we've been talking about, rebranding, um, you know, reframing, and, you know, opening it up to do an open house this summer um, or fall because a lot of people do come on vacation but um, I think this survey just really <coughs> showcases all of the information that I've been hearing um, you know over the past six months before I became the new director and while I've been at the center um, and I think it's going to be a large marketing plan moving forward as to how to show people what we offer in addition to that. So yeah. this has been really informative. Yes, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And I think um, the, the thing that strikes me about this too that I think about a lot is that this whole, idea, and it speaks to the point that was just made, is that a lot of people wrote in or made, made it clear through the data that they don't need the senior center. And, and I think we want to change that conversation. It's not about, you don't need to need <laughs> anything to participate in programming that keeps you connected to your community and keeps you active in aging. Um, you just have to have a desire to do that. And so I think all of that um, together can be pretty powerful in terms of people's perception. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm head of the triad program through the sheriff's department. We do the outreach in South County. Um, we do a lot with the seniors mm -hmm. in town, um, even newcomers. Okay. Um, we use a lot of resources to reach out to them. COVID has closed a lot of doors. We all know that. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, the sheriff had shut us down from going into the homes, but we were still on the phones. We were doing handoffs. We talked at the doors, masked up, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, our reach is we use resources in our community, such as our high school, our students there. Okay. We work with different sports teams, and I'll use the uh, Frontier uh, baseball team. Uh, they're phenomenal. Uh, I get calls because people need their walkways shoveled in the winter, simple things like that. I can't get, get out, Sharon, because of that. And I call them and they go. That's fantastic. And there's also um, re, uh, adults that are retired too <coughs> that are able to do some of these things. Um, you're talking about food needs and stuff like that. We do that. We work with Jen, too, to get that stuff out. We actually had a meeting in here this morning. And um, we look forward to um, the outreach and, and helping. And I look around here um, tonight, and I see a lot of people in here that definitely reach out to us. And we use our private schools, too. Um, and I was just kind of educating Jen when she came on board with electronics. A lot of the seniors don't know how to use computers, things like that. In the past, we have reached out to Deerfield Academy and they'll bring students down to work with the seniors. And I think once we really truly get a roof over our head and have an area where we can have computers and those kids can come down and are willing to help, 
Um, I think that's a way of life today, and we're seeing more and more of that. Um, we have a book club where we gather books and we get them to the seniors who love to read. Uh, and they close down senior senior center right now. We had a little corner library there that I had uh, tried people going in and restocking those shelves on a weekly basis. And then people would leave books, give books, uh, that kind of thing. I, I What's the size of the triad program in general? So how many people do you have working on that? Um, there's an average of, um, we have our police chiefs on board for the three towns. They have officers assigned to us. And then we have um, two directly from the sheriff's department. We work with Dave Sullivan, our DA, and we have a representative um, that comes to our meetings and updates us on many programs such as the scams that are out there so bad right now. Yeah. Um, and we're blessed to use this building right now for meetings mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's just a little bit of what we do. Yeah. And we get the people to come to our centers, but a lot of things, a lot of things we hear is we don't have transportation to get there, Sharon. And we have a lot of that in the Sutherland area and we've been hoping to kind of correct that over the years. Yeah. Um, we do have a van sitting in the parking lot right now. I don't know what the status is on it, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to reach out to more. Mm -hmm. What's interesting too, I, well I think that's, I mean the triad program is fantastic as far as um, outreach and reaching vulnerable people and people who need that sort of extra support. What, I, what reminds me, when you mentioned the transportation, I'm remembering one of the statistics, I didn't include it in this presentation, but it stood out to me in the analysis, was we asked people about how do you currently get around. The, you know, obviously the number one way is people drive themselves. Um, but the second most common was they walk or bike. So that's another um, sort of indicator of sort of the, anyway, the act, just you know, thinking about are our, are the, are, are places walkable? Um, and our place is bike friendly um, in terms of if there isn't this sort of robust um, transportation support system, if people don't feel comfortable. Anyway, just sort of thinking about that, that sort of stood out to me as another opportunity. One of our things, too, is trying to get them to doctor's appointments. I took two last week. There's a lot of people that are reluctant to put them in their vehicles right. for obvious reasons mm -hmm. to get them in there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other additional questions? Great. So let's give Caitlin a round of applause. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Did I the slide the end of the there were a couple of recommendation slides, but my clicker isn't working anymore. Yeah. You want to just get yeah. to the end? There's many more in the, in the longer report. I just sort of pulled out a few examples of the kinds of things. Um, yeah. So um, talking about the plan for, escalate, for the, you know, escalating demand for the senior center programs, so that you know, in order to meet a higher demand of service, there needs to be expansion of space and possibly staffing as well. So in addition to exploring opportunities for additional space around the various communities, but also thinking about the, the building of a new space, um, so thinking about getting more specific about a site study or um, evaluation of existing properties. Um, we did hear um, about, mostly around sort of information and referral, people wanting um, to really be better connected to sort of mental health programming and being referred to other services that they want to get hold of. So just thinking about the ability and the outreach staff um, at the senior center to be able to accommodate that and, and also to think about this communication issue um, thinking about in addition to sort of the social service outreach also thinking about community outreach and sort of um, is that part of someone's job to be able to kind of continuously get the word out because it's not the kind of thing that's one and done it kind of has to be continuously done and I think Jen has something. We just hired an outreach coordinator at the beginning of April so we Great. are in progress. Check. <laughs> Um, and, and again, these recommendations are, are just that. They're just ideas. They're not prescriptive in any way. Um, 
so again, yeah, so the rebranding effort, which has also already been talked about as, an, as a possible recommendation, um, the satellite programming around the towns to promote senior center programs and draw in a wider range of residents, so at libraries, local businesses, and schools, um, especially as you're sort of um, without a sort of central space at the, at the moment. Um, there is an interesting, there's a club, I think it's in Southboro, um, called the Trailblazers Club that's out of the senior center and they do kind of like extreme sports. <laughs> um, they do like kayaking and mountain biking and all kinds of things. So I linked that um, just as an example um, as a program. And then the other thing that I think often goes a little unnoticed is that they're and it, but it, came, it was very clear um, in the survey, you know, you all have a lot of very educated, very skilled, um, very, you know, residents who have a lot to offer. And so to, we, there, and we also heard a lot about a need for the, or a desire for the lifelong learning um, aspects. So really trying to think about, even a small pilot program of, um, you know, a, a, a one semester sort of, are people willing to teach a class about something that they're passionate about, something like local history or, or something like that? Um, you can go on to the next. Um, and then welcoming first time participants or newcomers to the area who might be reluctant to participate. So sort of a new, having a new member breakfast or bring, you know, incentivizing people to bring a friend um, both to the senior center um, or also just sort of making sure that people are, who are new to the area are aware of the senior center's offerings. Um, the surrogate grandparent program sort of matches older adults. So we, we did ask about like, do you have someone around like within 30 minutes, um, family members? And so there was a, a small, relatively small portion of people who said no to that, but just sort of thinking about ways to connect people across generations. Um, and then um, this last bullet is about a citizen's civic academy. So one way um, towns, I've seen other communities sort of fill boards and committees is, is to sort of just um, create a program that sort of educates people about how local policy is made um, in the area and sort of tries to get them to think about how they could get involved um, in local government. Another programming idea. Um, so again, um, we heard transport for, by, for the majority of people, transportation is not an issue, but for people who you know, modify their driving or don't drive, it's a, it can be a real barrier to some pretty crucial things. So we talked about uh, the idea is sort of a travel training program. So you, you know, someone mentioned you do have some transportation um, options available, but I think there's sometimes a real intimidation factor about sort of, well, where does that bus go and how do I make a reservation or something like that? So to actually have um, a person who's sort of the guide, um, you know, sort of takes people on like, uh, trial trips so that people feel comfortable actually using the, um, the program or the transportation opportunities. Um, and then this other, the ride sharing thing, I know there's a lot of barriers to that, um, but I think there are some interesting things people at communities are doing to try to help older adults use ride share, although I don't know what the prevalence of ride sharing is um, in the area, but one thing that we've seen is uh, towns purchasing sort of electric vehicles or sedans or smaller vehicles that can be used um, to transport people on like a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, it makes it a little bit less complicated than a, a van or something like that. Um, and so that's an, a, an idea. You can go on to the next. Um, this was the, you mentioned a resource fair, but I had it specifically for family caregivers, um, trying to sort of specifically um, get them the information that they need. Also like a caregiver's night out where you might arrange volunteers to provide a couple of hours of respite while caregivers can have a nice dinner or something like that. Again, just sort of recognizing that that's a pretty common um, situation for people to be in. Um, the Memory Cafe, which is sort of, for those who don't know, sort of a very informal social gathering of people who are living with dementia and their care partners who get together at libraries or senior centers or um, cafe, you know, coffee places and they just sort of there have some music or a topic of conversation, but it's really just sort of mutual social support. Um, and so thinking about that as an option um, is, I think, they've proven to be pretty uh, helpful to folks in that situation. Um, we talked about um, some of these already, but you know, you do have some resources related to property tax relief programs in some of the communities um, or the, the grant, the CDBG, I can never, whatever, the Community Development Block Grant, uh, grants for home repairs, but sort of educating people about that. Um, educational workshops about financial planning, ways to use home equity to age in place, um, or to seek alternative housing models like home sharing or renting out rooms, which 
someone mentioned. Um, again, just trying to sort of get people to think ahead so that they're not in that situation when there's a, you know, a crisis, they can sort of think, sort of take some control um, over their future. And then um, ways to expand access to fresh and healthy foods, uh, farmer market delivery programs, or hosting even just like a weekly uh, community dinner kind of thing. That's it. So now we're done. <laughs> Thank you.